Sheila said, Hakskoil, Tanoyap, Carolyn Roberts, Quinnan Sna, Tanachta, Telas, Kohomish, Okameach, Nakwakwa, Okameach, and Chiactin, Okameach, Chin Kunman Tomi. My heart is so full and so thankful to be here today. Um, I come from uh, many, many generations of people living with and on this territory, on these lands um, of the, the Kwantlen, the Keitsi, and the Semiamu people who have been been living with and on this land for thousands and thousands of years and living on this unsurrendered stolen territory of the Kwantlen and the Keitsi and the Semiamu peoples, um, uh, knowing this responsibility that I have to um, give back to the people of these particular territories that I reside on today. Um, they have nurtured this land, they've walked gently on this land in order for me to be here. So as an educator, um, my responsibility back to the people of this land is to make sure that I educate about the history of colonization on these lands and on these peoples of these lands and how um, it has drastically impacted um, their livelihood, their land and the peoples of these lands. So um, I, I I don't take that responsibility lightly. I really work hard in the places and spaces that I that I talk and I educate in to make sure that I am um, educating others about this. Um, and I live um, right in between where my ancestors have lived. My father's side is out in the Chilliwack area of the Lower Mainland um, in the Shiacht and Stolo territory. And my mother's lineage is up past Whistler. Um, just for some kind of clarification, if you're not from this area, um, we we have um, we have a small territory just up past Whistler, and yeah, that's where that's where my family's from. And under the Indian Act, I am a member of the Squamish Nation, which is in the Vancouver area. So I thought um, because I have a little more time. Um, than what we had planned. I thought I'd just give you a little peek into what the land and territories are like over here on the West Coast. Um, from the stories of the long ago from our elders um, that tell us about this land, um, it was said that you could walk for four whole days without seeing the sun because of this canopy of old growth trees that used to stand in all of these areas. Um, and the trees were so large that it would take 30 people holding hand in hand to reach around the bottom of these trees. Um, our communities and our ancestors culturally cared for these forests, never taking more than what they needed. And they were always making sure that if they needed something from the land, that they would always be giving back to the land in reciprocity. And this was this is that relational kinship that Indigenous people have with their territories in which they live upon. This is a really beautiful visual of the territories of the Skohomish people. This is what is colonially known today as Horseshoe Bay. Along these, um, along these rivers and waterways, we had over 40 village sites that was rich in food and medicinal plants. It was beautiful for hunting and fishing. Um, but when the settlers came, sorry, the video just ended. When the settlers came, they couldn't see the vastness of this land and this, um, this relationship that we had with the land they came into our communities which is um, what we what we call in our our language with with hungry eyes in the Hokumitum language um, the term for settlers is holitum which in direct translation means um, always hungry but not always hungry for food but always hungry for what they could um, what they could see that they could take from this land um, and not be giving back in reciprocity it only took 30 years for settlers to completely wipe out the old growth rainforest that we used to have here and we're never going to see that again in our time in our in this generation or my children's generation or even my grandchildren's generation for what used to be here so um they just saw what they could take from them so this is a picture from the Vancouver archives and this is what is colonially known today as Stanley Park but this was our winter village site of Kwai Kwai for the Skohomish people and our chief Hatsalano and his family used to live here. At the turn of the century there was only about six families that were still living in the summer village um, 
before that there was lots more, but when the smallpox um, came and ravaged this area, um, it took out so many of us. So at this point in time, there was about six families that lived here. And this is an actual drawing from Hatsolano about the longhouse that stood there. Um, the longhouse itself was um, over 200 feet in length and um, what I like to do with my students, we go on field trips and we measure out how big the longhouse was that stood in this area just so that we can start to grasp and understand what the land was like and what the people were like prior to the colonization of this land. The last potlatch that was held in this particular longhouse was just before the potlatch ban in the mid 1880s. And there was over 2000 people that came to celebrate who we were as stomachs, as humans. Um, we had people from down to California, up to Alaska and all over that would come and celebrate. And if you were to come to a potlatch, you were always fed well and you were always gifted something before you left. And that was part, that is a part of who we are as people. You were rich with the amount of family that you had and for what you could give away. And in our potlatch ceremonies as our governing systems, it's um, how we pass on stories, traditions and dances and how we collect our families together. So um, when the potlatch ban came into place for almost seven years, drastically impacted um, our way of life here on the coast. So what I like to think about is um, and ask educators when I'm in educational spaces who has been displaced in order for us to be here today and thinking about the lands and the territories or which you are on as well and how does this impact your work as educators or leaders or even just as humans in these places we're in and how does it inform us as educators and leaders and humans, knowing that the land was never bought, sold or traded, what are we responsible for as humans and what do we do in order to give back? So I'm just going to take a tiny pause that if you would like to jot down some things or some things to think about and then I'll move on to the next thing so you can kind of process a little bit of those questions before we start. Okay, I, time is hard to gauge <laughs> when you can't see anyone. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna step into the work of circle work. Um, a lot of my work is guided through, um, through the lens of Verna Kirkness and Ray Barnhart's uh, work about the four R's. Verna Kirkness is this trailblazer indigenous academic that worked really hard to start changing conversations in educational spaces um, and through their work with this particular paper they demanded change in the education system for Indigenous students because they found that the educational spaces were unwelcoming um, and students, Indigenous students didn't feel like they belonged or um, felt like they could succeed in these places. So what they were asking for is not a lesser education and not even an equal education, but rather a better education. An education that respects them for who they are, that is relevant to their view of the world and offers reciprocity in their relationships and with others, and that helps them exercise responsibility over their own lives. And what they were talking about in the paper, what I, um, what I always turn to and think about is that they were saying that the band-aid approaches to um, education weren't working by offering tutoring supports and offering um, counseling supports and graduation coaches and all of these pieces were just reinforcing the assimilation process of Indigenous students in these colonial spaces that we are a part of. So what are some different ways that we can step into this work and help support this work in educational spaces is what I really um, what I think about all the time and how we do this work. So um, 
part of part of what that is is then it comes down to circle work for me and this is a practice that i have been doing for a really long time and i i have to admit like when i first um, started teaching i always taught in circles and it just has evolved over time and realizing as i as i learn more and i read more that this practice is is part of who i am as a as a person but also um, creates this community within my classrooms that i'm in so um circle work has been a practice in also in indigenous communities since time out of mind the practice of working in circle helps supports learning and community building and offers space for healing um, uh, for students as well. And the circle work that I'm going to be talking about today and that I talked about within my book chapter is a pedagogical tool that anyone can use um, in your classrooms, in your school communities, in your staff meetings, um, and other educational spaces. Um, it's just, it's a framework as a pedagogical tool and it's not ceremonial or a spiritual practice. It's just, it's a pedagogical tool um, and it can help you build community in your classrooms and for me I really see it as decolonizing our teacher practice in the colonial spaces that we're in and the five concepts that I'm going to be talking about is relationality, decolonization, witnessing, anti-racism and then of course I always talk about time. <laughs> so I believe that the foundation of our work in education is relationships and I believe that we as people can't learn and grow from each other without having this relationship with each other. So nurturing and supporting these relationships is what I believe is a practice and I use that term in intentionally because it's something that we have to continue to do all of the time um, and every time I do the work is a practice oh this work this didn't work and that's that reflective piece um, and how I approach this practice in my work spaces is um, especially like in my higher education classrooms I always start and end with circle and I open up the space and then I close the space um, when I was an administrator um, in the public school system um, I also did this with my staff meetings I would open with a circle um, and in my in my classrooms and um, I do have to admit though that I was a, a music teacher and it was pretty easy for me to be always in circle in these spaces um, so but it really changed changes how we are together in relationship with uh, with each other um, it really shifts um, the power relationships and changes that higher that hierarchical framework that is um, inherent in our um, education system and I have look at I have a really nice <laughs> a picture that goes along with it. Um, our colonial education system is very set, very much set up in hierarchies and very top down. Um, staff meetings that I was a part of were very much the principal letting us know um, what we would talk about and how much time we had and what our focus was. So, but by using circle work within the meeting time really changed this narrative and it changed the power dynamics of groups. It really it required uh, us as as a space together to be sitting and facing each other within the circle and I think that um, also being a facilitator of that circle then also changes that power dynamics and when we talk about circle sitting in circle together um, means that there's nobody in front and there's nobody behind us and that we we are there together as equals and allows for that space um, to happen so usually what i do with circle work um, whether it be sitting or standing or sometimes it's it's on the floor depending on the group that I'm with. Um, but I always make sure that there's chairs enough for everybody um, if we're sitting um, and then making sure that there's no distractions. And I got to tell you, in higher education, taking away um, cell phones and computers is so helpful and beneficial for people to be paying attention to the space that we're in. Um, it really creates that space of us really seeing each other in the space to together and helps us with that relationship building part um, and then connecting us in a different in a different way um, 
some of some of my students this year um, were talking about how how they felt vulnerable at first sitting in circle because they didn't have anything um, in front of them and I, sometimes it feels like that that protection but once we got into the practice of doing circle work all the time um, it it was way more comfortable for them as they moved through and they could see the benefits of it um, also, when we talk about um, being in circle together, it, it we're really talking about how we respond and see each other. And for me, I talk about this as being a witness um, in our circle, and it's asking you to participate in a deeper way. From my own teachings in my own Indigenous communities, being asked to witness something is a privilege and it's an honour, and it is asking us to be the teller of the story. So if I'm asked to be a witness, I have to tell the story of what is happening in that place so that I can then pass that information on to others outside the circle of what happened. So that's a really big responsibility and you have to be more attentive when that happens to what is happening. So it's really asking you to be a participant with um, what is being said and what is happening because you're trying to create and tell that story so that you can pass it on. So I think that the, it's asking you to um, show up in a different way, right? You need to be able to hear and understand um, the, of what's going on so that you can share it. So um, just thinking about when we are in circle together and when I ask students to be there, I do ask them and share with them what what does what is a witness um, in our community and how does that how does that unfold within our class and it's really allowing people the space and the grace to share their stories and have have an opportunity for them to speak um, and have the floor open for them to speak. So um, that then connects to when we talk about anti-racism. Um, and this is a really great book on Circle Works um, by Friar Graveline. And I'm not always sure I get the name right, um, but it's a really, really great book that talks about it. So when we're, when we're talking about listening to listen to other people rather than listening to respond, then creates We've created the community, we've created listening, and we've created opportunities for people to share their voice. So within Friar's book, there is excerpts of people that talk about um, what they heard and what they felt when going through um, circle work. And part of this one is Ken's saying that had he not listened to the students in his class talk about race and racism, he wouldn't have never had that opportunity to understand that their actions from this of being oppressed and um, living within the racism, um, how they were acting out was not directed towards him, but as an acting out of trying to survive in a racist oppression oppressive space. So Ken had the opportunity to listen and that's what it really means when we're talking about being in circle together and holding that space with each other to be able to listen. Um, hearing hearing the voices and the stories that impacted him and his knowledge and understanding of the students in his care was such a pivotal moment for him in understanding what it meant um, and how how much more information he needed to understand um, their points of view, right? So by actively listening to the harms of this, he was able to see the devastating impacts of race and oppression and also allowing him the opportunity to support the students in a different way as he now understands more about why the students are acting up and he can see the, the impacts of of how racism affects them on a daily basis. So, um, and then understanding that them acting out wasn't necessarily directed towards him, but it was um, a part of how they were dealing with um, what they dealt with on a daily basis. So by creating the spaces um, in your community or in your classroom or in your meetings, for people to really speak to be heard will help create that community of care, which can address racism within the spaces and how um, giving you opportunities to talk about it because that's an important piece when we're talking about learning about and working through racism when it happens. Um, 
And another thing that I, I think about too is, is the privilege, right? Um, those, those students like myself who are um, uh, underrepresented in, in educational spaces, we don't always speak up and we don't always share um, because we don't always feel like we belong and that it's it's part of our dialogue or part of who we are as peoples. So we, we don't always share in spaces. So it is such a privilege to be able to have that space to be able to talk. And sometimes those who always have the ability and privilege to talk don't understand that privilege point. So creating the space that um, allows that opportunity for us to be sitting um, together in relation and opening up that space, it might make it to the point where then we can start saying and we can start having discussions because we feel like we belong in those spaces. So again, it's that relationship and that kinship of how it all kind of intertwines together um, in these spaces. And then time. <laughs> I love it. Time is a colonial concept. Um, time is different for every community um, when we when we think about time and this linear concept uh, of time um, through our education system is what I'm talking about with this particular side. Um, because when I talk about doing circle work in classrooms, um, I get I, I get teachers going, it takes up so much time that it's just not feasible in the high paced time centered world of education that's dictated by the clocks and the bells and the lunch and the recess and all of those pieces. Report cards need to be done, learning needs to be done so that we can fix it and fill it all in. So. Um, um, I understand like I understand <laughs> when when people say that, but what I can speak to is my personal experience with doing circle work is that it is really transformative because you're asking people to come into a space and be in that moment differently than all of the other spaces in our educational spaces. <laughs> the effects of each learning community that I've been into been in and doing this work is priceless even on online when we were um doing zoom for all that time for through covid it far outweighs the benefits far outweighs the consumption of time that so this linear this linear concept of time of western concept of con time really controls our spaces and it's something that can be commodified something that can be consumed like almost everything else in our system today but when i think about time when i'm in ceremonies or in community um, it looks different and it feels different when the work starts it starts and when it ends it ends so that that um that really alleviates a lot of things. And that's what I feel when I'm in circle with others. Um, my children are just getting it now. <laughs> they, they've stopped asking, when are we going to be done when we're sitting in ceremony? It's done when it's done. So when all the songs are sung and all the people have talked, then, then it's done. So the concept of time in our colonial system and the pressure of time is what challenges is one of the many challenges in our education system but i think it's a big challenge right so when building community community and connections with each other there isn't any quick fix there's no quick method or fast tracking um, to building community it takes time and it takes practice so facilitating and leading groups through circle will take practice, but the outcome is going to be priceless. I, I have students from my classes that have connected and stayed friends far beyond the university um, because of that community that we build. Um, and as you get to know your team or your students or the group that you're that you're working with, you'll be able to start to feel their energy and feel connected um, and know when they're doing well or not doing well. Right. It's this connection that is priceless, um, especially coming out of um, COVID-19. And we really need to start to be how are we um, thinking about building communities again together, um, being in space together. Um, 
So yeah, so it comes with active listening, um, being a witness rather than actively talking and trying to fix problems or outcomes or um, solutions. It's about taking the moment, taking the pause to be together, building relationships and community and being really present in the work um, is what um, I see uh, circle work being. So um, things to keep in mind, what do we do when we sit in circle and how do we how do we navigate that and how do we invite people in? So um, usually when I open up the circle, I always remind people to step into the circle with an open heart and an open mind, um, trying to understand that um, we may all have differing points of view and points of being, but it's really important just to be um, open to how the circle will unfold and to each other. Um, acknowledging that each person always has an opportunity to speak if they want, but they always have the opportunity not to speak as well. I think that is just as important. Um, and when speaking in the group, speak from your heart and listen respectfully when it's someone else's turn, no one else is talking in electronics or way, unless it's needed for accessibility. Um, and the facilitator usually starts and then you go around the circle um, and allow people opportunities and this relational accountability of what sit what is said here stays here unless we ask permission um, to tell stories to take it out elsewhere. I think that that's also a really important part when we're talking about um, circle work and um, being relationally responsible to others. So it can look it can look different in all the different spaces that I'm in. Sometimes when we have a lot to do, when I'm teaching in higher ed, sometimes it's just a temperature check. How, how are you doing today? And where are we at in the work? Because we know that once it comes to midterms and then the final, like everything is like for the students. <laughs> There's no word for that. Um, so sometimes those are just check-ins and then check-ins at the end of the class. Um, but sometimes it's especially like when I first open up a circle, I open up um, similar to what I did today. I told you um, my ancestors and where they were from um, and getting to know me um, and the location of me and my family is really important in Indigenous communities. Um, so we can see and know where your lineage is from. And I love doing that when I first start circles um, in like at a at the start of each semester um, to get to know our people in the classroom and their locations of where they're from and where their ancestors are from. It's a really great way to um, to open up um, and start to see see people and maybe see where um, their connections are to us um, and to the land that we're on. Um, but other times it's just the relationship building is so we're going to go around circle today and we're going to talk what's your favorite ice cream. Um, I usually I usually ask what's your favorite ice cream and where where do you get it because I like to find new ice cream places um, and that helps me but then you know taking like music and art and books and all of these different kind of quick questions also makes connections for people in the classroom to see where they where, where they connect with um, music what's their favorite music what are the favorite books what are the favorite genres they like to watch all those different things help connect and build that community with each other so some of the questions group um, I like to, to is like please tell the group who you are what is the work th that you do and if you're comfortable please share with us um, where your ancestors are from um, that's like usually like my first welcome go to slide of um, how, how I open like on the very first day kind of things um, and another another opportunity is um, um, whose shoulders do you stand upon and how do they shape who you are as a human and an educator? Um, I, I, I particularly like this one because knowing where your ancestors are from and connecting with your community is, is so important. Um, and this one kind of moves it to who, who are the people who have come before you in the work that you do that um, has helped shape who you are as an educator and shaped who you are as a human. Um, and these 
don't necessarily have to be your ancestors and relatives. It can be other people who have had impacts on you and how they shape you as um, as a whole human being in the places that you're in. And then this one is usually like the last question that um, that I ask people um, at the end or at the closing of a circle. Um, and what are you taking away of value today? And I have and I this one is is there because of my wonderful friend Justin Wilson, um, who um, who teaches me all the time about how to be an educator in the classroom, and he talks about being an educator as um, as an uncle in the room, um, and it, it makes that relational kinship um, stronger. So I always like to to see my education through the eyes of being an auntie in the room. And he always asks this at the end of the day because he wants to he wants to know what the students are gathering and taking up from the work that they're doing together um, in the space. And um, it's it's interesting when we do ask this question of all of the different connections that different students make with different things within the classroom. So um, I think it's it's an, an important reflective practice. Do we always have time for that at the end? Not necessarily. Sometimes it's a quick exit slip. Like what are your key takeaways? Um, uh, things like that, or um, sometimes it's a word or two at the end. It really depends on the time you have. Um, and it also like it depends on your class and, and where they are in the moment. So using circle work um, is for me as a practice, it is just a constant thing that I do in order to build that relationship so I can get to know my students so that I can better support them in their spaces and the places that we're in and um, and to build that. And what's coming into my mind is um, when I was working at Simon Fraser University, I had a class that I was teaching. It was Ed 311, and it was about Indigenous pedagogies and history. And it was usually a course that students took at the end of their time at university. And I would have students from all over the university come and take this course. And finding out that they actually didn't have relationships and connections to other students in the program that they were in was really disheartening for me. But also uplifting that they actually made connections in my classroom because of how we did this work, how we connected through circle and opened and closed every day in the circle space where they felt like they had an opportunity to speak, to be engaged and to be involved in the learning process was really beneficial for them. And then I think about my my oldest who is taking science at university and how her whole entire first year she actually didn't talk to any of the other students in the class because it wasn't it wasn't made for that it was very um the banking concept of education as pablo fair says right just the teacher at the front dumping the knowledge to like 400 students so i think in education we have a um we have a different setup where we have smaller classes where this kind of relational work can uh, and practice can happen. So um, that's what I think about when I think about how how we can use this and how it can support um, the work that we do. Um, and then that was my last side. You can find me at Twitter just like, oh, I guess it's X as Sheila and I found each other there um, and also on Instagram. At, and I also have a website with um, more information about me and the things that I do. But yeah, I think that's the presentation and I'm totally open for conversations um, from people or questions. How's that? <laughs>